I want to tell you today first about a group of teens from Miller, South Dakota. They get together and they are working to make their community a better place. And like a lot of teenagers, they feel like there is nothing to do here. And so they come up with these ideas, and one idea they came up with was to have a movie theater because these teens had never experienced a real indoor, sit-down, buy popcorn movie theater. But this is a town of 1,400 people, so this is a challenge. And the young woman that you see here holding the microphone is named Abby, and she took this idea on, she presented it to a meeting that's not unlike this, it was a meeting full of adults. And as she excitedly told them about their idea for a movie theater, one of the adults said to her, in front of everyone, that idea is too big, it's never going to work, and you shouldn't even try. Now, I'd like you to be shocked. And you're shaking your head, no, because you're not. People have done this to you too, haven't they? People have thrown brick walls in your way. And we know what those brick walls sound like. We tried that once when Dan started on the job. In what year? Don't say. <laughs> we can never do it again. All right, That will never work here. It's a terrible idea. You shouldn't try. Slow down. We need to ask more questions. Let us have time to talk it over one more time. And you may be tempted to agree with the idea of slow down, let us ask more questions. But it's a trap. And it's a trap because we are terrible judges of failure, the risk of failure. Author Margie Worrell said that using the latest brain imaging technology, doctors have been able to determine that our brains vastly overestimate the risk of failure. And they underestimate the risk of sticking with the status quo. So when a negative person or a person sounds negative, they're trying to help you. They're trying to help you avoid failure, but their brains are likely overestimating the risk and lying to them. And that other risk, that underestimating the risk of sticking with the status quo, is exactly what Will Rogers pointed out when he said, even if we're on the right track, we can get run over if we just sit here. Because the decision-making process doesn't work like this. The diff we have to decide between where we are right now, where everything is fine and we're safe, and the risk of change, which is like out there and something scary. The decisions we have to make are between the change that we're going to create when we decide to act and the change that is coming at us if we fail to act. And if we haven't learned anything else in the past few years, it should be things can change really quickly and are continuing to change all the time. But as Susan pointed out in her opening message in your program, we are resilient people. Rural people, we have had to adapt before. We have dealt with every kind of change imaginable. A lot of us, our towns have lost our entire economic reason for being, and some of us multiple times. And yet we have found ways to survive, we do a lot with a little, and we have a lot of resilient skills that we've had to learn the hard way. And right now we are changing and innovating the way that we work together. This is a picture from the playground in my hometown of Alva, Oklahoma. It's about nine miles away from my little town of 30 people. And this is the playground equipment. I heard that. <laughs> a muttered swear word, practically. This was it. This, my mother remembers this stuff when she was a kid. And there, believe it or not, a group of moms decided this was not good enough for our children today, and that it was not safe. This is cut sheet metal. <laughs> Looks fine, right? Like generations of kids, I survived that, it'll be fine. Now this group of moms who, t who were fed up with that situation 
decided to take action. They did not start by making a presentation to the city council. They started by texting each other. They started a little group messaging thing. They started talking about it. What would actually work in our climate? Where can we get it? How much is it gonna cost? And then they were like, and then how are we gonna get the city to go along with it? And did that second. And they didn't know it, but those moms succeeded by using the idea-friendly method. So here they are cutting, over the past 10 years, they have replaced equipment in all the parks, all across Alva. And they used the idea-friendly method, which pretty simple, you may wanna shoot a photo of it. This is what we're gonna cover. You're gonna gather your crowd, you're gonna build connections, and you're gonna take small steps. So here's how it works. You just start with your big idea and you take small steps because that, you'll notice that they were able to clean up the boat, get rid of this, the cut sheet metal. But the difference is they started with that. They did not start by trying to do the expensive new equipment. They started small and that made a big difference. So you gather your crowd with your big idea, one that you know will make a difference. You build connections to bring people together and then you and your newly powerful network of people take small steps together. So it does not matter whether there are lots of folks in your community who are with you on this or not. It is something that you can start wherever you are. So I want you to actually take a moment and think of one thing that you know will make a big difference for the quality of life in your community. This does not have to be something that you think you should want for your job necessarily. But do think of one thing and write it down. Write it down. There'll be more. <laughs> now, with the idea-friendly method, I like to start with take small steps because this gets us into action right away and people can find out what we're doing. So the old way, anytime we've got an idea, we want to make it happen for our community, then the first step is to hold a meeting. And what do we do at the meeting? We write the plan. <laughs> And we're stuck in that meeting room. And there's always one person who's like, oh, I think we should also do this. And they're adding things to you. And then there's always that one person who says, oh, the Chamber of Commerce said they might do something like it. So we shouldn't step on their toes. We can't do that part. So you can't leave the meeting room until you have it all planned out and nailed down and everyone agrees. So let's do the new way. The new way is to take an immediate small test. This is the process that Pascagoula, Mississippi is using to spur more entrepreneurship in their small town. What they have done is place a dozen tiny houses on an empty lot. And those are available for prospective entrepreneurs to rent. But you don't even have to start big enough to fill a tiny house. What if you're even smaller than that? You can start with a booth or just a table just for one day at one of their market events. And so that allows people to start where they are with what they have, do one small test, learn from that and grow. Then they can grow to be big enough for a tiny house and then be large enough to move into the downtown. City officials said this has worked to build equity. It has improved wealth through entrepreneurship and it has seeded businesses that have grown big enough to be full-size businesses in their downtown. So they consider it a big success. And lots of ideas will fail. Maybe most ideas will fail. But the idea of taking small steps is to reduce the cost of that failure to be as small as possible. So if you fail at selling cans of pop at a market event for one day, that's not terrible. If you fail at running a business that has a million dollar collateralization, that's a big deal. So we would rather have you take small steps and work your way up to it. So that failure then is free, high quality research offering direct evidence of what works and what doesn't. And we want you to know that small steps build up. You take each individual step, you're working your way up as you learn what works, or you learn that that's not the idea for you, and then you can move on. And when you apply this concept of taking small steps to going into business, you get the innovative rural business models. These are tiny and temporary ways for people to try their business idea. This is the method that Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico is using to encourage their artisans to grow to their next logical step through shared vendor shelters and temporary market events. So I want you to think about what is your small step. Look at your idea 
that you wrote down, and if you didn't write it down, go ahead and write it down now or make a note on your phone. What's your idea of what's your first small step? Now that you've got your first small step, we're ready to start gathering your crowd so that it's not just you working on it. Now in the old way, what is the old way to get anybody to work on a project? This is the, you got assigned to the committee because you left the room plan, isn't it? I actually got an email from an organization in my big town, my nearby big town, and it said, we are working on our annual projects. Please see the attached committee list and let us know where you are willing to serve. Thanks for your support. This is not the best way maybe to go about that. So what would be the new way to bring people together to work on a project? The State and Sublimity Chamber of Commerce in Oregon killed off their committee structure. They only bring people together only when they need them. And their uh, former director, Elena Turpin, told me that they spend more time telling people how they make a difference in the community. She said, that way, your organization becomes a movement that people can get behind and not just another volunteer opportunity. So there's a big difference between being a movement that people can get behind and please be on our committees. And so what that looks like, especially to younger people and especially to the people that you are trying to get involved in your idea, is not to say join our committees, but to say, here is this activity, here is how it will make a difference in the community. When I was in Caldwell, Kansas, which has a population of about a thousand people, it was really interesting because I noticed that people that were a little older introduced themselves by the organizations they belong to and serve. So they were, one person said, I'm on the Chamber of Commerce Executive Committee, I serve on the Alumni Board, and I volunteer for the Historical Society, which is great. But as we got around the room to some younger people, they were more likely to say something like this. One woman said, well, um, I like gardening. Uh, some friends and I have a book club. I love reading. Um, oh, I have a little free library. So she's describing not her organizations, but what she enjoys doing. So if your organization goes to people on the basis of making a difference in the community, doing the activities you enjoy doing, you become that movement that people can get behind and not just another volunteer opportunity. So how can you have activities that people enjoy doing? What's an activity that you can write down now? The town of Pullman, Washington, has a dirty sidewalk problem. They're kind of on a hillside in Washington state, and so every time it rains, leaves and trash wash out of the streets and onto their sidewalks. I was there, we did a walk around, and they told me all about it and how they usually do a cleanup day every so often, and that they were behind, they should do another cleanup day. So after we went, walked around, then we had kind of a little work session of what were they gonna do next. And so in the discussion, somebody, Probably it was Dan, I don't know, but like, is like, the chamber did the last one. The chamber should do another cleanup day. And I said, no, you do not get to pin it on someone else. And if you don't want to do it, if you don't want to take the lead on it, then it does not need to happen because it's not your priority. And they were pretty uncomfortable with that for a little bit. And then one business owner named Willow spoke up. And I think it's important you know which one of these people is Willow. Way behind the flowers is Willow. And she spoke up bravely in that meeting and said, I will clean my own sidewalk, which is great. But we have to get from there to like enough to clean up the entire downtown. And so, Willow does actually have to start by cleaning her own sidewalk. But what I suggested was that she take a picture when she does her sidewalk, put it on social media, hashtag it, clean your own sidewalk day, and tag two friends. And this worked for Pullman. And now all of the merchants go out and sweep their sidewalks on Wednesday mornings and afternoons. And then the next morning the city sends around the street sweeper and picks it all up out of the gutter and cleans the streets. It's awesome, but what if at that walk around or in the aftermath, Willow, who is this giant presence here, this is Willow, 
had tried to convince everyone at the walk around or in the meeting afterwards, hey, we should all sweep clean our own sidewalks, right? And then try to convince the city. Change the work schedule for the person running the street sweeper. We'll all do that together. What would they have said? That's if they're polite. Did I hear a no way over here? Like, that will never work? Who was going to say that? And somebody would have said, oh, we should just do another cleanup day. Willow did not try to convince a single person of anything. Willow cleaned her own sidewalk and made it easy to join in. And that's the difference. Now, this is, you want to either shoot a picture of this or you want to note it in your notes. Draw a little picture of it in your notes or shoot a picture. This is the volunteer motivation curve. (laughs) Beautiful, isn't it? Okay, so this maps your motivation. You are the most excited person about your idea, right? It's your idea. You're the most excited about it. And then there's your buddy who will help you do anything on earth, right? They're about this excited. But they'll do it because they're with you, right? We know how that goes. And then you see the dashed line. That is where the committee ends. Everybody on the big end is on the committee. Everybody down there, they are not on the committee, so it doesn't really matter what they think or what they're doing, right? I mean, they could tell you, but they're not on the committee, so it doesn't really... We have been focusing all of our volunteer recruitment efforts where? We're looking for the most motivated people on earth. There's not very many of them. We have all these people way down here. They're not as motivated, but we don't have anything for them to do. We don't have, we need you to serve a three-year term on the beautification committee. Okay, that takes a lot of motivation. I need you to come on Saturday for the cleanup day. It's going to be 100 degrees out. Bring some water. So we've been looking at this all wrong. Let's flip it. This is still the volunteer motivation curve, but now we're going to put your motivation at the bottom. The most excited people are down here as the foundation. And then every single additional contribution on top of that can add up. Professor B.J. Fogg's behavior model says that as long as we make the size of the step that we ask you to take match the level of your motivation, then you are able to act. But if we ask for more than you are motivated, then you can't do it or won't do it. So we have to give people small but meaningful activities that help make that difference happen. And what about the people who are pulling the wrong direction? Don't worry about them. Those are not your people. And you cannot lose people who were never yours. So I want you to write down right now something smaller. See, this makes it a little easier. Something smaller but still meaningful. And then we're going to move on to build connections because this is where it gets kind of fun. So there's an economic developer named Jessica who is in Idaho, and she told me her big idea is to get a microbrewery in her town. So because she works for an economic development group, then she can go and make the presentation to the board and say, I think we should have a microbrewery. And then they can ask her a bunch of questions. Um, They can refer it to the subcommittee on business development who can order a feasibility study, who can continue to discuss it. It can eventually get sent back to the board. They can add it to the five-year business development plan. And then they can tell Jessica, oh, we're going to give you some incentives to go, you know, try to recruit somebody, go steal somebody else's microbrewery. That's the old way. So what's the new way? Let's just start a homebrew group. Right? Like, let's get people who like to make their own beer together in somebody's backyard. And what will happen? They'll drink beer. That's the first thing. But they'll talk to each other. They'll, they'll give ideas to each other. They'll have a great time talking about making beer. And I promise you, after about the second beer, maybe the third, somebody in the group is going to go, I could run a microbrewery. <laughs> What's everybody else going to say? Yeah! (laughs) You could do it. Now, you probably know of a microbrewery that started when somebody that was a home brewer made the leap, but if they had this whole supportive group going, yeah, you can do it, 
then that would help. But also, these are the people who will say, hey, I know where we can get this special hops that's being grown. Hey, I actually know somebody who runs a brewery. Let's go talk to them. Let me connect you to the state people who know about the regulations. Let me come and help run the microbrewery for the launch. They will be more successful because they built connections and built community around their idea. Community happens when people talk to each other. They built community to be more successful. Community happens when people talk to each other. And we love to talk to each other when we get together. And we also know that from Professor Brian Uzi that when we get different people together, we'll get more innovative ideas. Because people raised in different families, in different places, in different communities or cultures, they're going to have different ideas. And we're going to need some different ideas because our 1950s ideas are a little bit like that 1950s playground equipment. It's going to take some updates to make it work for us. And when you apply this concept of building connections, allowing people to talk to each other and support each other, you get the rural jobs creation strategies. This is what is being used in Brownsville, Texas. They have a retail group. They meet in each other's back room. They ask questions. They get answers. They get to talk about what's working and what's not. And they get this information not from somebody who's an expert, but from each other, from other business owners who are their peers. Now, how could you, what's your homebrew club? What's your homebrew club for your idea? Beer optional. Gather your crowd, build connections, take small steps. You do not have to know all the answers. Has anyone ever told you that? Everyone comes to you, they expect you to have all the answers. I'm telling you right now, you do not have to know all the answers as long as you'll stay open to new ideas. Iowa State University did a study of 99 small towns. They followed them for 20 years. And they found that the towns that succeeded the best were the ones that were open to new ideas and welcomed newcomers into making decisions about the future of the town because they brought new ideas. And this means being idea friendly means letting go of judging ideas. So when someone comes to you with an idea that you think is stupid, it means not saying, That'll never work. It means maybe taking a breath and saying, could you take small steps? See, this would be more polite, wouldn't it, anyway? But it's also more effective because you may find out something you did not know. Remember Abby in the movie theater idea? Abby and her friends actually had been to one of our presentations and had heard my co-founder, Deb Brown, and I talk about the Idea Friendly Method which means Abby knew how to take small steps. And so what they came up with was to do a temporary movie theater. They borrowed the school auditorium. And then they picked a little kid's movie and they invited the grade schoolers to be their audience. And then Abby and her friends, they got to hand out the imaginary tickets. They got to run a little concession stand. They got to run the projection. And for one day, they gave those grade school kids that experience of being in a real indoor, sit-down movie theater. Because that was the experience that Abby and her friends wished they could have had when they were kids. And so when you tell people that'll never work, then you miss out on the amazing ways that your community can make experiences together. It means not voting on ideas. Downtown expert Jackie Wolven told me, you know, when you vote, the same people tend to lose over and over. That's pretty hard on a community. So the question we have to ask ourselves is how will inaction cost us one year from now? Winoka, Oklahoma, I helped them to get a downtown grant a long time ago. (laughs) I wrote the grant and they received it. And then they started through this process of getting designs. So they're getting new streetscapes, lights and sidewalks and everything. 
and eventually they get to the point in the project where the architect comes in and comes to the city council table and drops three sets of plans and basically says, pick one. Those eight city council members and the mayor in a town of 900 people, they're not architects or urban planners or engineers, and they do not have anyone like that on their staff. They have no way to look at paper plans and really know, is this the right thing for my community for the next three or four decades? So they talked about these plans over and over again, and they would keep discussing them and debating which set should we go with. Now, what is the cost of inaction? What is happening to the value of their grant dollars as they keep debating? What's happening to the cost of materials? It's going up. Yeah. So there is a new way to do this, and it doesn't take a lot. The new way, anybody could walk into City Hall and pick up a copy of the plans and a roll of duct tape. I think we can make it. We've got the copy of the plans and a roll of duct tape, and we're going to walk up to each building, and we're going right here. It says there should be a ramp in front of this building, so we're going to take the duct tape, and we're going to mark it on the ground, on the sidewalk, and we're going to label it ramp. And where it calls for plants, we're going to actually go borrow somebody's potted plants, and we're going to put them right where it says there should be plants. And where it calls for bricks, we're going to go into somebody's backyard and borrow a bunch of bricks that they're not using right now. We might even ask before we borrow them. It's a small town. Set up the bricks. And then we can all go walk through this together. The city council, the whole town. We can even do something that Winoka is very good at, which is close the streets and hold a pop-up event and have everybody walk through the plans. This is the real life rendering. Now those eight city council members and that mayor have something to judge by. And not just by trying to look at the plans, but by going out and experiencing it together. Plus, they get together input from like everyone in town. And someone may have a really great idea. And if we're really mean, we'll make that architect go through there too. And then we do it again with the second set, and then the third set. And we have to run tests like this because all of our communities are different. All of our communities are different. A town like Rising Sun is as different from accident as much more than any two big cities are different from each other. Our communities are very different. We have to test. Even if we have an expert opinion, that feasibility study on the microbrewery, who knows, like they never even came to town. That engineer that drew plans for Winoka was probably there for a full day, right? We need to run tests. We have to find out. It will never go back to the way it used to be. We have to start from here and go forward, one small step at a time. Allegheny County, Maryland. All right. The big employers have moved out. Mm -hmm. Last year, Newcore Steel made the largest private investment in West Virginia history, which is nearby. How do we get big businesses to move into Allegheny County, which is suffering with population decrease. All right, so Iowa State University, this town is called Webster City. My colleague, my co-founder, Deb Brown, is from Webster City. She moved in the year after the uh, big appliance manufacturer moved out. A town of about 6,000 people, they lost over 600 jobs. And it had, they had actually lost over 2,500 jobs over the three years that they took to shut down. So this was a major that kind of a loss. Um, and at her first meeting there, a member of her executive committee said, what are you going to do about filling the empty buildings downtown? Because there were 12 empty buildings in this downtown. And Deb said, what we are going to do is we're going to tour those empty buildings. Because she believed that people wanted to start businesses in Webster City. They just didn't know where or how or really, she didn't know it yet, but what was really going on was everybody thought they were doomed. They had lost the, the employer. They thought that was the end of it. 
So they did a tour. They did a tour of empty buildings. They, they um, made a map. They, like This whole story is online, and I'll be glad to tell you more about it. But basically, they started showing people, you can go and set, start a business in our downtown. There are opportunities right now. They did a lot of talking to people. They got it into the media. And what happened, if you see the employment graph, you can see over the three years that they closed the factory that employment did that. And then there's one more year of knock-on effects as other businesses in town went out. And then my, my friend Deb starts here. And over five years, here's what happens to their employment graph. And they made it back. They made it all the way back to all the employment that they had lost. There was no new factory. There was no new factory. They did it themselves. They grew their own businesses. And then they were not susceptible to one single group moving out. They had much more resilience. And so any one loss, they're able to repair a lot more easily. And so it started by completely changing the conversation from well, since the factory closed down, or when we had the factory, or if we ever get another factory, she changed the conversation to what are we going to do right now with what we have right here? And so that's not exactly the question you asked, but that's my answer. I want you to think right now, what is one small step you can take right this second? Can you send a text right now? Can you block a time on your calendar? Can you reach over to the person sitting next to you and say, the person we should talk to is? <laughs> That's great. That's the kind of action we want to see. What can you do right away? The other small step that you can take right now besides like setting some time on your calendar is you can also get this. This is a gift for you. It is a 30-minute video that goes over these same principles that you can share in your community because it's one thing for you to go back and go, uh, something about connections and small steps, I don't know, but you can actually use this video to share in your community and then you can have that discussion. You can go through the video, and when you get to the part where it says, write it down, like there's a stop sign on the screen, you'll know that means stop the video and write it down. It's super useful for spreading these ideas in your community. It is at zero charge, so use it. While you're at our site, you'll get other things, including you can get that graphic of the idea-friendly method. We have weekly emails that are also no charge that will help you keep up the excitement and give you something to talk about as a group. It can be like your book club for a better community. Thank you very much. Thank you.